nothing like a hot cup of tea after a long day of chemistry. Let me just uh, stir in some sugar here. All right, real funny guys. Where's my spoon? The answer to that question is in this here chart. Recognize it? There it is in all its glory, the periodic table of elements. Perhaps to some chemists, it's a holy testament to the power of science. But when it first came out, it was a different kind of holy, and its journey to classroom walls everywhere had a whole lot of bumps. The tale takes us back to the mid-1860s. Ulysses S. Grant is president of the USA, Germany elects their very first chancellor, Ernest Rutherford is born, and about 63 elements have been discovered so far. But the beautifully organized columns and rows we know today hadn't been devised yet, and chemists were just starting to glimpse the repeating chemical properties they represent. John Newlands, Lothar Meyer, and Dmitri Mendeleev were all working on their own theories of the elements. Newlands actually predicted the yet-to-be-discovered element of germanium, but his version of the table wasn't recognized until over 10 years later. Meyer's work actually seemed more promising. He brought some organization into the elements by classifying them according to their ability to combine with other elements. But he only managed to work that out for about 53 of them, and his table didn't have room to grow. Which is a problem, because remember, there were 63 elements. This leads us to St. Petersburg, Russia. Mendeleev is teaching organic chemistry at St. Petersburg University. There he publishes a book called Principles of Chemistry. In this book was his version of how to organize the elements, the periodic table. Here's what the table looked like, but something's off. Mendeleev's table was full of missing holes, because he'd figured out something the other two scientists hadn't. Mendeleev recognized that the elements' properties repeated in a pattern. They were periodic and he figured any new elements ought to fit that pattern, even though no one had observed them yet. His proposed table left room for all the missing elements. This was more than a chart. It was a tool that could predict things nobody even knew about yet. Mendeleev gave names to these undiscovered elements, such as Eka aluminum, Eka silicon, and Eka manganese. Over the next four years, no new elements were discovered and the periodic table remained unchanged. Enter French chemist Paul M M M Emile. Help me, internet robot lady. You're my only hope. Paul Emile Le Coq de Bois Baudron. So our friend Paul was in France studying sphalerite using analytical spectroscopy. This was the most cuttingest, edgiest version of the good old flame test, thanks to work by Robert Bunsen and Gustav Kirchhoff. The new spectroscope allowed chemists to measure the colored light that's produced when metals burn. Regardless of who burned the metal on what part of the planet or what prism they used, the same unique lines would be produced for the same metal. This gave chemists a fingerprinting system for the elements. So when Paul's sphalerite sample showed a completely new light spectrum with two violet lines, he realized he'd discovered a new metal, a new element that fit the properties of density and atomic mass that had been predicted by Mendeleev's holy periodic table, right there in the spot good old Dmitri had labeled Eka aluminum. But instead of that, Paul called his new element gallium. Now, uh, here's where the drama comes in. Mendeleev claimed he discovered gallium, but Paul disagreed since he kind of did all the work. In a sort of Crimean war of articles in scientific journals, the Russian and the Frenchman duked it out for years. Think of it as like the 19th century version of an epic Twitter beef. The winner of this battle is right there in the name for gallium. Mr. Paul gave it a play on the Roman name for France, which is Gaul. It was kind of a trend in the 19th century to name elements after geographical regions. But maybe he actually named it after himself. An English translation of this French chemist's name is Paul Emile the Rooster of Boisbaudron. And the Latin word for rooster just happens to be gallus. By that logic, gallium narrowly misses being chicken eum. So anyway, how much did science benefit from this newly found element? At first, gallium wasn't super useful. Its primary use was for thermometers due to its low melting point, and because it's not toxic unlike that nasty mercury. Chemists like to say that gallium melts in your mouth and in your hand, right? That's, that's definitely a thing people say. Gallium's low melting point is also great for pranks. Pranks like making a spoon disappear in someone's hot cup of tea. Being a shiny metal, it was easy to disguise gallium as silver. Tricksters would fashion it into a spoon, then hand their mark a cuppa and what looked like a regular old piece of silverware. You can order a gallium spoon and try it for yourself, as some of the comedians around this office have evidently already done. Gallium isn't considered toxic, but you shouldn't swallow it either, so I'm just gonna go make a fresh cup, I guess. Today, gallium is incredibly sought after, not for tricks, but because it makes a fantastic semiconductor. 
A semiconductor is a material solid that can pass an electrical current under the right conditions. Since chemistry allows us to manipulate what the right conditions are, semiconductors have revolutionized electrical circuitry, making mass production of electronics and computers possible. Some semiconductors are also gangbusters at converting light into electricity, giving us inexpensive solar cells. Gallium arsenide is a very common semiconductor, which you might have in your pocket right now because it's in the chip in your smartphone. And it powers those plucky robots rolling around the surface of Mars. Gallium is so popular these days, some say it may be even more useful than another common semiconductor, silicon. Maybe one day tech billionaires will start saying they live in Gallium Valley. So the next time you sit down with your precious mobile device watching science videos on YouTube, make sure to thank Paul the Rooster and his rival the Bearded Russian.